Good morning, everyone. This is Lee Jandro with Abundant Grace Fellowship in Keene, New Hampshire. And uh, I just want to welcome you this Sunday morning uh, as we get ready to talk about equipping, equipping in the church. Um, for those in our, in our personal fellowship, this is our first morning where we're able to actually get together. And so uh, we're grateful for that. And um, we'll post more of those kind of things within our, our uh, private Facebook group. But for those of you who are visiting and everything, we just welcome you this morning. Father, we just pray for each and every person that watches this morning. We ask you, Lord Jesus, just to bring blessing into their lives, to uh, let them know how much they're loved. Father, increase revelation and wisdom into their lives, Lord God, that they might come to know how great your love for them is and how much more you have for them, that their best days are yet to come. And we just thank you for that now in Jesus' name. Um, if you're visiting, uh, you can follow us on the Abundant Grace page. I know there's some watch parties that will be available, uh, some public, some private. Uh, people who have wanted to give by offering and things like that, you can make your cheerful giving. You can use, uh, we're currently using the Tithely platform. Uh, you can find that information at the top of the page if that's your method, um, or you can mail in or uh, make it available in another way. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. <clears throat> One of the things that I've uncovered, as I think many of us have in the last days, uh, over the last six months and things like that, is without gathering, there's been a shift in the church. And some of that shift that's occurred has occurred uh, in part because we, we hadn't been able to gather the method, in, the method or the way that we previously had. Uh, some of the things that happened in our personal fellowship, we met in a hotel, hotels fell under a different heading, and so their ability to meet the uh, criteria that the state put out or the CDC put out uh, minimized their ability to have people come into their conference room. So we're still kind of in that mode on some levels. Uh, to date, they've not been able to offer us another gathering place, and we continue to pray for them regardless of their circumstance. Uh, this has been a difficult time for many. But one of the things that we, we notice is that the, the, the piece of connecting with people, those that have desired to connect with people have connected with people, and those that have been struggled for whatever, uh, you know, just the other day I posted an article, and I've been saying this for a long time, that even in the church, we've seen areas of addiction increase, areas of abuse, areas of divorce and relationship difficulties occur through this, these lock-ins and the inability for people who are not quite as healthy to be out and about and do all those kind of things. And so what we've lost, we've lost some of that, that ability to uh, minister and things. So what I wanna talk about this morning is, is the equipping piece. And, and so I'm gonna read you some scripture and then I'm gonna share some things that um, I think have occurred in the body of Christ, and they've been exacerbated by the crisis that we faced in this, you know, not just in this country, but in the world. And so I, I want to read you from Ephesians. It says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean? Except that he had also had descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is himself also he who has ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some, this is 411 in Ephesians. Um, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to the mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs in the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects unto him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. 
there's a lot in this group of scripture. We see things that talk about each one of us has been given a gift, and each one of us has the ability to increase, bring the increase of faith within the body of Christ, and each one of us has the ability to undergird the body of Christ and to edify them and exhort them to better works. And we see that the, the, the growth of the body of Christ into maturity. And so that's where we live with this. Now, there's a gentleman, he, he, uh, there's, his name is Tony Morgan. And he wrote this book called The Unstuck Church. He says, as you are probably aware, there are thousands of churches across the country that will never grow because the, the senior pastor is doing all the ministry. And, and what he's saying is what we've developed kind of in our Western culture as opposed to a, a, a Middle Eastern or even a Far Eastern culture is we've seen people um, just uh, relying totally on the one or two or three or half a dozen people who may be in the ministry. And so I want to talk about this, not from a negative place, but as an encouragement to each one of us that we would be able to see the equipping of the saints and that we would be able to carry out the ministry of the church. And when I talk about the church, I'm not talking about a specific building or a specific place or even a specific fellowship, but that's where it begins on some level is that when we equip people and we empower them, uh, they'll move away from being what many people have called the consumer church or the give me, give me, give me church. And they'll move away from, it used to be pew warmers, but now most churches tend to be more contemporary and have chairs. So from chair warming. And so what we have is we have invested gospel coworkers. When I came into the kingdom uh, 31 years ago, there was an expectation, I think, that everybody was gonna do something. And, and maybe we just haven't figured out how to continue to communicate that. We certainly back in those days on many levels, we made that a legalistic requirement. And, and, you know, and, and I myself probably would have said, you know, what begins in the flesh ends up in the spirit, that if we teach people how to do these things, we'll end up with people that are doing these things. And they may not like it in the beginning, but where they'll end up is they'll end up with, um, they'll end up doing the things that they need to do. So there's a difference between teaching and discipling. Teaching requires two things. It requires a competent instructor, and we know in the body of Christ there's many of those, and this, there's no diss on that. But it also requires receptive students, and, and there's, no, uh, there's no small amount of those as well. You know, for years, you know, people would say that there are, they were armchair Christians, which meant that they would watch their local preacher or, in many cases, national preaching, and things like that, and, and, and I absolutely endorse that to the extent that it causes us to move ahead and do something. But the difference is that discipling and equipping requires a lot more of us. When Jesus addressed a crowd, he addressed people uh, you know, in uh, what we would call teaching to student mode, and he, you know, he had compassion on crowds. You can find that in Mark 10, in Luke 11, in Matthew uh, 9. But with disciples, he engaged on a, on a greater level. And so in our own ministry and what we do, um, I think where we need to be is the first piece is we need to develop an intentional relationship. Uh, it's more than just downloading, and please, please hear me, I'm not making fun of it, it's more than downloading a good message or sitting in our chair and watching a good message. That's certainly easy enough to do, especially since COVID-19 hit, and so many churches broadcast their messages, just as we do here. But the ability to create discipleships doesn't work on the same level. So it requires, um, it requires a surrender, if you will, of people's lives, a willingness to say, that um, I'm going to surrender my life and I'm going to develop a greater character, if you will. I'm going to develop a different behavior and, and, and things. And, and so I do not think, please hear me, I do not think that can happen in what we call mega churches or large, large gatherings. I think there's a reality of those things, and I think those things may well be important. But the fact of the matter is that Jesus worked with 12 people. And I think once we grow beyond 12 people of influence that we have influence over individually, we lose sight of that. And so Jesus recognized that, that he couldn't take care of more than 12. So you have to begin to develop more people. Now, currently, many of you have probably seen there's, there's some young, young people for the most part, but they're encouraged by a lot of other people. There's, a, there's, there's, a, there's worship gatherings happening throughout the country, and, and, and I think those things are great, but they're never going to create discipleship. 
So it doesn't mean those aren't important. It just means they're not going to bring us to that place uh, of, of changing things. So the next piece is that, you know, each one of us has to be a willing example. In Luke 640, it says, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. Jesus didn't uh, just want people to know about him. I think that's important, but he didn't just want them to know about them. He wanted them to know him and become like him. So three years into his ministry, when he ascended, first group of scriptures I used from Ephesians 4, what we found was we found this scattering of people because they didn't know what to do. But the fact of the matter is Jesus had poured into them for three years. So at some point, they began to catch what they, they needed to do. Because we can get information anywhere. You know, we, we, we joke that you can find anything on the internet, and that's totally true. But what we do with that information is, is the flip side. Just last night, I was talking to my grandson, and we were talking about a particular video we watched. And I said, I would like it to have more in-depth teaching, if you will, with it, rather than just the actions that they were doing. It wasn't saying that what they were doing was was stupid or unimportant, but if you're going to do something, what what is the scientific theory about that, you know, behind that? So, as I say, we can get our information anywhere, but ultimately we want to get it from Christ, and we want to get it from Christ's people who he has discipled into him, and usually that comes through other people. With Jesus, he, he, began, he began to give them assignments, and I think that's one of the things I know on a personal level that um, that hasn't always been clear with me, and, you know, and, and for that I have to uh, you know, accept the fact that I didn't communicate some of those things. But if we're going to give a clear assignment, Jesus, an example would be where Jesus sent out the 72, and he gave them a very specific assignment, and he said, prepare the towns for where I'm going to show up. And he told them to go out two by two. And, and many of us know those verses. But then the next piece of discipling was he asked for an accurate assessment. When you went out, what happened? And they began to tell him. They said, even the devils fleed. And then, you know, Jesus goes into, it almost sounds like a rebuke, but I think he was saying, you've gotten a lot out of me up to this point. But now I want to, I'm going to add a little more to that. So it was more than teaching. Um, it, it has, it, you have to be able to disseminate the information, but there has to be an imparting of the knowledge. And so good sermons, unfortunately, I, I, I don't care who they are, and I don't mean that in a negative way. They don't always give, um, they, they may only touch on one part of the discipleship program. Today, we can talk about equipping, and some people may say, well, I've heard this before. I don't need to listen to this, and that's okay. You don't know me necessarily, and I don't know you, so really all, what, all we have is the ability to transmit information. The difficulty becomes if we don't take that information, there's this process scientifically, psychologically that occurs. If we do not take that information and utilize that information within a very short period of time, we think we understood it, and we think we got it. And so therefore we can, if you will, kind of go buy the t-shirt, been there, done that. But the fact of the matter is our mind has tricked us into believing we've been there and done that. Rather than equipping, we've gained information on equipping and we've done nothing um, with it. So teaching creates students. I don't think we really need any more students. Equipping brings about disciples. And so the Great Commission talks about what a disciple might, might look like. They're going to be able to pray. They're going to know the Word of God. There's going to be intentional training. And there's going to be a connection with other people. So, you know, we have the, what we call the fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, and um, evangelist. And, and so the apostle, he, he is he or she will only be able to share their, their DNA. The word means sent one, the word apostolos. Um, so we need to have a pioneering spirit. If we don't have that apostolic DNA and fellowship, it, it's, going, it's going to almost freeze up. It's not going to go any further. And the reason it's not going to go any further is because it doesn't have that pioneering spirit. When I was young, and, and you know, I was born in 1955, 
everybody wanted to be a pioneer, it seemed. We were going to the moon, you know, we sang songs about it. There was all these things about going and doing these great and wild and crazy things. And I was, even yesterday I was talking to Jacob, there was an expectation on us that we would do that. We need the apostolic pioneering spirit, if you will, to begin to occur in the, in, in the church. We need to have the prophetic DNA. We need to teach people to listen and, and to, to gain revelation. I tend to walk a lot in the prophetic grace. One of the things I say to people all the time is lay on your bed and behold Jesus, because you need to hear what the Father's saying. You know, we need the evangelists. We need that person that comes along and stirs up the church, if you will, stirs up the fellowship, gets them. It's not just about getting them out onto the streets, but it's about helping them discover their neighbor and, and things like that. We need the equipping of the shepherd or the pastoral gift, you know, the feeder of the flock, the person who takes what's been preached even this morning and begins to break it out for people and say, where do you fit in? That there comes this awareness, if you will, of servanthood and compassion. And then we need the, the teacher, the person who's studious. You know, one of the things I was thinking about this morning as I was getting ready for today was the teaching piece tends to be those who do research, but it's not enough to do research. Research is only one piece of the puzzle. We need to be able to take that research and communicate that research to others in methods um, that are helpful to them. We need equippers. You know, we need people there, you know, there's a call that if you know that you're, you have this grace for uh, being an apostle or an evangelist, pastor, teacher, or, um, or prophet, you need to begin to walk in the equipping piece. It's not enough just to walk around and please hear me, you know, but with the badge that says you're a prophet or you're an evangelist, but you need to take more than that. And just because you have, it doesn't mean there's not some young man or woman, doesn't have to be young, um, some man or woman who needs what you have. Um, so one of the things we figured out, we, we use this word, you know, these words about staying in our own lane, is we can only do what we can do. Um, you know, they, they found, it says, and I want to read from Acts 6, it says, in, these, in those days, as the disciples were increasing in number, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. The twelve summoned the whole company of the disciples and said it would not be right for us to give up the preaching of the word of God to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, select from amongst you seven men or women of good reputation, full of spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So they recognized that there was something about that, that they need, God wanted to honor, see the, the word, the, um, the local church honored in the method and the manner. So they knew that preaching was important. They knew that teaching was important. They knew that prayer was important. But instead of doing it all themselves, they felt the need to hand this over to people that we, we now call deacons in the church. So what would the church look like? I think it's important that we begin to get a picture of it. A gentleman named Ed Stetzer uh, said this. Uh, he wrote a book called Transformational Church. He discovered that the majority of members in the evangelical church are not engaged in meaningful ministry or missions. And so what would our churches look like if they were equipped and empowered? COVID has made it really easy to make the gathering a secondary factor rather than um, maintaining the primary need for gathering, um, which is not just to hang out, but it's to pray, to exhort, to encourage. Do you have a song? First Corinthians 4.12. You know, do you have a song, a psalm, a spiritual hymn? You know, we, we need to look at those things and begin to embrace those. <clears throat> so I think that for all of us, some of the things we're facing, whether, whether it be the upcoming elections, whether it be sickness and health, dealing with the mental illness that's occurring more and more and exacerbated by COVID, or the addictions, or the abuse rising, or the, the relational sh uh, relationship breakdowns, um, we need to have, we need to figure out getting back to what works. Um, and it's going to require people 
who we're going to call leaders, for lack of any better word, John Maxwell says, the one who influences others to follow only is a leader with certain limitations. The one who influences others to lead is a leader without limitations. There are people in our own fellowship who know that they're called to lead. They know that they're called by, by grace to individual categories, whether it be the fivefold, those kind of things. And, and the choice is now yours. We collectively as the fellowship, as leadership, as whatever you want to call us, we desire that you would bring increase into your life. And so I want to talk about um, some steps that we um, as, as a fellowship can take on, but you're welcome to utilize these in your own life. I think that for us, we need to redefine and communicate the responsibilities. Um, it's one thing to have a vision. It's another, you know, it's, it's easier, you know, it's easier if you have a vision, it's easier to put together a puzzle if you can see the box. Um, I don't do it that way, but that's what people tell me. Um, I'm okay that people do it that way. So I, but I do think it's important in this particular uh, aspect is that people need to see that box. What does the puzzle look like? That, you know, so we need to help people with goals and tasks and responsibility to get their input. You know, there's a book written called The Leadership Challenge. And these are things that contribute to people's motivation the chance to do something to feel good about themselves, the chance to accomplish something worthwhile, the chance to learn new things, the chance to develop new skills, the amount of freedom you have to do what you do. Um, you know, one of our, perhaps even a couple of the fellowships my wife and I were involved in, there was, all, there was times where there was very little freedom given, so you just felt like you were doing something just to help them out and not really seeing the future. Um, of what God wanted to do. Psychologically, people, um, people find that they need a chance to be tested. They want to make it on their own. They need a chance to take part, if you will, in a social experiment. They need a chance to, to these, these all add to their psychological value, to do something well, to do something good, a chance to change the things the way things are. So we're sitting in this time where many people know what's going on with, you know, whether it's elections or mass or Black Lives Matters or whatever the challenges are, cities, states, all those kind of things. So what can you and I do that will make us feel good about the things that we want to not only change, but change for the greater good of, if you will, all of humanity? Every time you or I help someone, whether it's an act of kindness or paying it forward, what we're doing is we're bringing increase into the kingdom. The next piece is something that's been jockeyed around too. It's about giving authority equal to the responsibility. That if you tell someone they get to make a decision, then you cannot berate them for making the wrong decision. You know, you can't short circuit the process just because someone made a mistake. That's akin to telling your child, you didn't tell your child to climb, that he, could, he or she couldn't climb on the table. They climb on the table, they break something. Unfortunately, I'm going to say as a parent, you don't get to blame the child for something that you never told them they couldn't do. Now, you and I may go, oh, that's common sense. But common sense, unfortunately or fortunately, is more learned, if you will. It's not just something we, 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 we intuitively get. And, and people that tell you that, honestly, I would just say for the most part, I don't, I don't agree with that. For those that know how to save money, it's so, it, they probably made mistakes with their money. For those that have learned how to maintain relationships, they probably screwed up some relationships. So the next piece is we need to establish, you know, a standard, if you will, for excellence. I'm not talking about perfection. Perfection is not equal to excellence. Excellence can be perfect. But just because something's done perfectly doesn't mean it's necessarily excellent. Um, so we need to, you know, when, when the apostles in the book of Acts wanted to hand over the ministry, if you will, of taking care of distribution to the widows, um, they said you need to find seven people of character or of good reputation. So we need to establish excellence once again in the church. And so because, uh, just went back, got to roll the page. Um, 
we need to have some you know, operating standards. Some of the ones that came out of this book were, we need to honor our commitments. We need to believe in being people of character and integrity. We need to be faithful to our responsibilities. We need to be wise stewards of our time and our talent and our treasures. We need to work together. We, we agree to disagree, but we don't get to disagree. And when I say that, I'm not a big fan of we agree to disagree. Because if you just say that, then everything's up and can everything can be on fire. But if we're in disagreement, then we don't get to do it disagreeably. We need to do it with compassion and love for one another, with the goal being, you know, sometimes it ends up being a compromise. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's all Johnny and sometimes it's all Joey, you know? And, and we need to um, work towards that. We need to, be, we need to commit to getting better in our own lives, to continue to develop. We need to be committed to excellence and we need to be committed to results. I talked about Jesus asking, what happened when you went out? How did that go? And so part of it is as a fellowship, we, the equippers, we need to train people. Um, I, I hand out uh, a sheet of paper, or it's actually more than one sheet, by John Maxwell, it's called the five M's of mentoring, you know? So this is kind of it in a nutshell. I do it, and then I do it, and you watch. And then you do it, and I watch. And then I allow you to do it. And then the final step is that you do it, and you hand it off to somebody else. So one of the things that we run into is over time, people were, uh, you know, the church hadn't figured out that they need to provide these resources. So I think that we, the fellowship, we, the church at large, we need to make available knowledge and information. And in the beginning, I talked about knowledge and information. It's one thing to be educated. It's another thing to have the resources that you need to do. So if, if you tend to, if you're going to be somebody that's going to go work with the homeless, finances is important, but also, you know, food, volunteers to work with you. How do, how do we grow others up into taking care of that ministry? So um, the, other, the other part is that we need to provide regular, appropriate, um, positive feedback to people. We need to reinforce what they're doing. If they make a mistake, we need to do it quietly. Um, you know, we, we need to have that conversation. We need to deal with situations as they come up. We only address one issue at a time. We discuss only what a person can do something about. I tell people all the time, if you bring me a problem, bring me a solution, or at least your solution. It may not be the solution we end up agreeing on, but all too often people are quick to point out what's not working. And instead, they may well have the idea that makes this uh, situation get better or work. We, we never use sarcasm or anger to discipline. We, we never correct uh, using those things. We, we get the, you know, we want the person to, if they've made a mistake, to be responsible just as much as when they, they have success, we want to give them the credit to them and, and, and their team. Book of Revelation has this thing we used to call the Revelation sandwich. This thing I have against you, but this you've done well, but this thing is still not working. And what it means is you take a negative and you put a positive in the middle and then, or, or you know, our reverse that, I'm sorry, the positive, negative, positive. You put the negative in the middle. This thing you've done well, this thing you're not doing so well, but this thing you're really working on. So we have a positive, a negative in the middle, and a, and a positive at the bottom. And so oftentimes that comes right out of the book of Revelation, which is why I call it the Revelation sandwich. The next thing is we need to be able to, you know, we need to recognize and reward efforts. For instance, we have, we have a couple that are in our fellowship that do a lot with the homeless. Uh, they make a meal prepared every week. Now our ministry separately gives uh, money to this uh, organization that deals with the homeless in our town. And we have people within our fellowship who give on a regular basis uh, to take care of those things. But this couple has taken it upon themselves and they've been able to incorporate others, a couple of family members, a couple of young people to make sure that meal uh, gets done. So we need to recognize those things, you know, all too often, you know, there was this thing in the church where you never can see what the, le you know, the left hand can't see what the right hand's doing. And, and so what people began to take that to is never, never uh, recognize somebody for the good things they've done. And so, you know, they should have just done that anyhow. 
But the fact of the matter is we need to recognize people. Jesus recognized people. People talk about the rewards in heaven. There's going to be a recognition. So uh, the next part of equipping comes down to trusting people. You know, if somebody says they're going to do something and you've walked in the mentorship process with them, then you need to be willing to uh, trust them. And, and, you know, like that means that you listen to them and you hear them out and you're sensitive to what they're going through. Um, all those things are, are important. Uh, we need to, if you will, give people permission to fail. I think that one of the hardest things in the church is, you know, um, especially where they tend, please hear me, where they tend to be more legalistic, someone makes a mistake and then, you know, they're never forgiven, you know, like in five years, you might be able to work your way back through the parking lot attendant uh, realm. And I think we just need to accept the fact that people are going to make mistakes. It is not about them being human. That's not necessarily an, an excuse that um, I think I think is real. We are supernatural beings, but we still make mistakes. That's a different topic. You know, some of those mistakes may be acts of omission. We didn't know what we were doing. It didn't get covered. Just like the child, as I mentioned earlier, who crawls up on the table. The uh, all too often. Uh, we've, we've got down on people who have made mistakes and it's made it really problematic. The Bible talks about ways to deal with people that are going through problems, whether they're church leaders, Timothy uh, or Matthew, about how to deal with things that aren't working out, you know, those kind of things. We need to allow people to make mistakes. If they're regularly making the same mistake, if you will, then I think it's important to the church in the equipping process, as well as the loving process, to sit them down and say, how come we keep ending up here? Is this the right fit for you? Because it may not be. You know, it may not be at all. Um, the last part is important to me. Um, we need to treat people with respect, uh, regardless of whether we agree with what their uh, what their solution is, or their challenges are. We need to r respect people for being people. The other piece, and I've taught a couple of messages on this over the years, and I actually thought about doing it this week and changed my mind, is honor. Honor, we need to treat people with honor. When we honor somebody, it's not just that we honor them because they're a great person. Maybe, they're, maybe they are a great person, but what do you do? Can you, are you willing to honor the person that's making the mistake? And I think it's really important that we learn how to do this because honor and respect are two different things. All too often, respect becomes a position thing, but honor ought to be that we honor people because we recognize who they are in him. And so as we make these changes in our own fellowship and we break these things out, um, there's good, you know, these changes are as important for me as they are for others. How do we handle the situations that come up? What do we do with these things? But the most important factor is why are we doing these things? If we do not equip people properly, then what does the next uh, steps begin to look like for the church at large? You know, I say this about the educational process in schools. COVID has thrown the school systems a curve. It's thrown parents a curve. It's thrown children a curve. Children don't necessarily know what they need to learn. So the reliance is on the parent to make sure that the school um, does what it needs to do. It's the same thing in the church. The church can have well-meaning good people who have tons of information. But the fact of the matter is if that information isn't conveyed, you know, I, I know a lot of young people with children, and they, the, the young people were brought up in the church. So they have a background, if you will, of these things. But if they do not convey those things to their children, then how is that going to get conveyed? So parents have a responsibility, just as much as the church at large, to equip their children, to teach them how to enter into his rest, to encourage them to pray, to encourage them to spend time in the Bible, not as a legalistic thought process, but as an equipping process to develop a receptive heart. Train up a child in the way he or she will go. That doesn't necessarily mean that Johnny's gonna learn the same way as Jane or Jane's gonna learn the same way as Joey. It means each child is individual 
And we need to look at that. And unfortunately or fortunately, that continues on as people get older. It's not that they're immature because they choose to be immature, though I guess that could be the case. But a lot of times we come at somebody in a process that's not the way they learn. If you ask me to learn off a video, I struggle with it. If you ask me one-on-one, -on -one, I'm your man. I mean, if you, if you want to teach me something, sit down and say, Lee, I would like you to learn this. Okay, I'm, I'm good. So we need to find out the best way to communicate, and we need to communicate in a method and a manner that brings equipping to a new place. So that's where I'm at for this week. We are going to uh, take communion here, and um, I invite you to grab a piece of bread, a cracker, juice, wine, whatever you have, and uh, just we're going to do this in a minute or two as uh, my wife's handing out elements here to people. Um, so why do we do communion? I think it's an important question. We do communion partly as a reminder, but it's more than that. It's a powerful, um, if you will, a powerful opportunity to see the body of Christ, to recognize what Jesus did and why Jesus did it. Jesus sat there, uh, you know, with, with his disciples. He sat there with the, the men that he had poured into for three plus years. He was e eating a meal with them. And one of, the, one of the things he said, he said, I want you to take this bread. And, and, and he, he took this bread and he broke it and he distributed it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body. This is my body. As often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. He wasn't saying, I think you're going to forget me. But what he's saying is, you're going to remember my teachings. You're going to remember the miraculous. You're going to, you know, they didn't know that they were going to see his body be bare the 39 stripes. They didn't know that he was going to hang on the cross. They didn't know that he was going to usher in a kingdom that was totally different and even foreign to what they had been thinking all these years, despite his numerous times of saying things. And so even in the, the, uh, the equipping process, they didn't have it all together. But God, through Christ, he trusted them. This is my body. As often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. When we take this bread or this cracker, we take this and we expect the miraculous. We expect healing in our bodies. We expect wholeness in our being. Beloved, I desire that you would prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. So as we take this, this uh, element today, this is the miraculous body of Christ. It's not magical. It's miraculous. And in like fashion, he took the cup. This is significant, if you will, of a new covenant. A covenant that has greater value than the previous covenant we've served in, even up till this point. That when we take this cup and we drink of it, we're saying that we believe in the new covenant, that we believe in the covenant of grace, that we believe that Christ himself fulfilled the law, that we don't have to fulfill the law. We're saying that this is a greater covenant between God and God rather than just God and man. Previous covenants were between God and man. This one was between God himself and Jesus the Son. So as we drink this cup, we're, we, we bring in the miraculous and um, understanding of who he was and what he ushered in for us, and we're grateful for that. We're going to close. I'm going to close with prayer. I hope this has helped you. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for each and every person that has been party to this. And I thank you, Lord, that I'm grateful for the people that have articulated some of the things that I shared from some of their books. Thankful for you, Lord Jesus, for all that you do in our lives and your grace towards us. And so, Father, as we come into this week, I ask, Lord, that you just open our eyes to greater truth. In all things, that revelation and wisdom is what we walk in. 
And we thank you for that now in the name of Jesus. Amen. We'll see you next week. I don't think it ended though. Thought it ended. Oh, there we go.